Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning into Molly's Salon. This is our weekly program every Thursday evening where I interview innovative thinkers and creative firebrands. We're living through a critical time in American history, the COVID-19 pandemic and a vital social justice movement led by Black Lives Matter. Our guests are a variety of artists and leaders discussing new ideas, how they're coping with the coronavirus and making positive social change, as well as showing us glimmers of hope for the future. And don't we all need that now? And tonight, in about two hours, will be uh, the presidential debate. So I'm sure everybody who's listening is gonna be tuning into that at nine. My guests this week are Melanie Adams, director of the Anacostia Community Museum, Leslie Ishi, Artistic Director of Perseverance Theater in Alaska, and Alejo Vieti, costume designer who has worked all over the country and the world. So first up, we will be hearing from Melanie, and she is the Director of the Smithsonian's Anacostia Community Museum. She's had more than 25 years of a community engagement experience in museums and higher education. She's dedicated to bringing stakeholders together to address relevant community issues. She has also been deputy director for learning initiatives at the Minnesota Historical Society, president of the Association of Midwest Museums and served on the special administrative board of St. Louis Public School. Welcome, Melanie. It's so great to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. And I love your necklace. You, Thank you. you something about it. So tell us. Uh, oh, how- I was saying, you know, it, it reminded me of an RBG descent collar. I've, I've had it for a couple of years and then I pulled it out and I was like, that's exactly what this looks like. So happy to wear it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. They always remind me of a, like a wonderful breastplate, you know, right. something that, that, uh, that uh, protects you and strengthens you at the same time. <laughs> So Melanie, I'm really curious because your work has ranged through all age Mm -hmm. groups Mm -hmm. from your time with St. Louis public schools and museums and historical societies. And now here you are at the Anacostia Museum. And where do you see the role of museums in today's fast paced online world? Well, first um, the Anacostia Community Museum, hopefully people um, will visit once we're back open to the public but we were founded back in 1967 out of a time just like this. Um, So think about 1967 and the racial unrest in the country. And so we were founded out of that moment for exactly the type of moment we're in now. And so I really see museums as a place that people can go hopefully and learn, but more importantly, create opportunities for dialogue. Um, One of the things that really attracted me to the Anacostia Community Museum is our mission is centered on the community. So when when you look at our mission um, and our vision, which is creating an equitable future for all, our mission talks about um, catalyzing community power. So traditional museums, your mission will be collect, preserve, share. Whereas ACM, we really center the community to be able to tell the community stories and hopefully by using history, we're empowering them um, to make positive change. Oh, that's so beautiful. Melanie, so how do you empower people? How do you make sure people are communicating? What, what, what kind of programming do you use to further this aim? Right. I think what's really important, especially um, with history, and so my time in St. Louis, I was on the school board for nine years, um, which is something I don't think I would ever do again, but did it for <laughs> nine years. And really what you find out is the kids don't learn a lot of history in school. We all know you're trying to get to the standardized test. And so a lot of times for people coming into the museum and seeing people who look like them, seeing stories that maybe they had heard from similar stories from their grandparents, it's empowering to see stories and to understand that you have value in the larger historical narrative. And that's what I think um, museums such as Anacostia Community Museum are really able to do because we're telling the stories of the everyday people. It's not like there's anything against famous people, that's great. But when you're hearing the story of like the barber who lives down the street or your lunch lady, you're seeing people and their stories and you're like, I can be like them. Um, And so that's really what we try to do. Yeah. 
And we live in such a anti-historic time. I think and history gets a, history gets a bad rap. And I think I say that because I'll be around people who say, I hate history. And it's like, well, what do you mean by that? They mean usually how they were taught history, just being taught, had to memorize dates. Yeah. You know, history, at least when I was going to school, it was not taught in stories. It was, you're going to memorize these dates, memorize these events, and you have to be able to put them in order. I agree. Whereas it's all about storytelling. Right. And I think, I'm sure that's something that we share with you because in the theater, that's what it's all about is storytelling. Well, you know, and I it, think there's so many times where that even overlaps because a lot of the museum work I've done, we use theater. Theater is one of the best ways to tell a story. And so we'll do a theater piece in one of our galleries. Yeah, it's a good way to tell stories because audience puts their feet in the shoes of the actor and, mm -hmm. and, and in a sense becomes them. That's so great. Um, so history, because it's such an interesting thing, especially when we realize that it's a story being told and sometimes not all the facts are told accurately. Do you find that you need to seek out the truths when curating for the museum? Or is it different for you? Because as you said, this is the story of ordinary everyday people. Well, I think the difference is I always like to say when people think that we're revising history because we're diversifying the narrative, stories are always told from one perspective. So you want to have diverse perspectives on the same story. Um, and so that's really important when we think about whose voice is being centered upon that story. So even if I think about my brother and I telling the same story, it's gonna sound different based on our perspective. That doesn't make mine any more right than his, but it's multiple perspectives. So hopefully from hearing a story from multiple perspectives, you're also able to then glean kind of what makes the whole. And I think most importantly, it's, it all matters also where you start the story. If you, you know, you always start the story where you're going to look good. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so that's also important when people think like, oh, well, you're revising the narrative. And I'm like, we may just be starting the story in a very different place than where traditionally they may have started the narrative. Okay. I love that. I love that. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Melanie, um, when you reopen, because mm -hmm. of course our museums and our theaters aren't open now. What's the thing that's just in your gut that you're saying, when we reopen, we need to do this? Right. I think one of the things we really need to do is to continue to find ways to push our content outside our four walls. Because I think even when we reopen, I question how comfortable people will be coming inside of a building. So what we're doing for the next few months is we're actually focusing on how can we have content outside of the building so our first exhibit that we're opening in April will actually be outside on our plaza. Oh, great. So, so yeah, so we're already thinking about that. What can we do to be outside of the building? I love it. I love it. Yeah. How can we open the walls? So I just have one more minute with you, unfortunately. Uh. I could talk to you all <laughs> night. But I'd love to know, what's your biggest glimmer of hope that you see in the future? I love the way that people have been involved in the democratic process and are taking to the streets. I think I'm seeing that more than I ever thought I would have in my lifetime. And to just see the diversity of the people um, and to see the young people. Um, so that's what really gives me hope is they're gonna make this place better. <laughs> they are indeed. And I would completely agree with you. What a, what a bracing uh, time this has been all over the country, yeah. Great to talk to you, Melanie, and Great to talk I hope to, to you. come and see you in the museum when, when you're open. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Next up is Leslie, who is the Artistic Director of Perseverance Theater in Alaska. And she's a director, she's an actor, she's an activist. Her work has been seen at theaters across the United States and on film and television. She co-facilitated the launch of Theater Communication Group's Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Institute and is a member of the core faculty with Art Equity, which works throughout the United States with arts and culture organizations on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So Leslie, it's so great to see you and it's so great to see you with that backdrop. What an honor and a pleasure to be with you, Molly. I never forget that you were 
people, you know, Perseverance Theater was like your first baby. And yes, here I am on Klinkadani, you know, here also known as Juneau, Alaska. I, I took love this it. with my phone. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, it's 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 beautiful. It's a beautiful backdrop. Yeah, I started the theater in 79 with a whole group of people from Alaska. And now you are the artistic director. And I'm so thrilled that you are, Leslie. I know you're already doing wonderful work there. And I can only imagine uh, how odd it is to be in the middle of the pandemic in your first year being at Perseverance Theater in Alaska. So tell us, how, how, are, you, how are you navigating all of that? Yeah, uh, good question. We, and as we speak, we're continuing to, as they, they, I keep hearing that word pivot, you know, and I think it's, I was reading a book called Stretch. And it talked about not chasing after, but how do you right size, but stretch, see the resources you actually have in new ways. So I think that it's really helping us to, um, to connect with people. You know, I think one of the things I pride myself on is, well, and it really can because I have to pay homage to my grandparents, parents, and my own um, elders and mentors, Yuri Kochiyama, an amazing um, activist in the Black Power Movement who worked directly with Malcolm X. And she brought community, the Asian community, she brought coalition to the civil rights movement and the Black Power Movement. And she charged me with being a bridge builder. So during this time, as we stretch, as we look at what resource we have, I see it's actually people. And I've been growing up all this time and now putting it all into action or continuing to put it into action as a community organizer. That's part of my activism. So I just love, uh, I, I, we held an artist forum, one of the first things when we got into this new chapter at Perseverance, and we listened to the artists. And Molly, your sense of community is alive and well. They were so glad to come back and have a conversation, and we learned a lot. And we're actually changing structures because of it, how we cast, how we have a work week so parents and families can, can stay involved. And um, that COVID for me has just helped us deepen that. How do we help each other during this time? How do we listen into community very deeply? And if there wasn't a safety net there, how do we build one together? Oh, there's one here. How do we extend it? So a lot of the creativity is derived out of that. And then I'll share with you, when I first was, uh, I want to say auditioning, but interviewing for the job, I said, you know, oh my goodness, the state of Alaska is vast. You serve Juneau, you've been connecting and transferring shows up to Anchorage. How do you reach the rest of the state? Do you use technology? And there hadn't been quite either the bandwidth or maybe the openness to that quite yet, but people said, oh, we'd love to do that. So with COVID, this whole pivot to go virtual, to me, it just brought that right to the forefront. And I'm a someone who looks for the silver lining. So I thought rather than trying to get that in there in between physical production and we kind of keep that alive, but build on it, it just brought it right to the forefront and we're being able to reach more people statewide and even nationally now. So we're still in a kind of an infancy stage, but our managing director, Frank Delaney, awesome partner, he comes from the IT world. So we're so fortunate. And That's our, so great. We're so lucky. And our associate managing director is a filmmaker as well. So we're just, uh, everyone's so multi-talented and this new team is game. So I just want to always lift them up because they're bringing every skill set. And um, so, yeah, we've been able to mostly go virtual and serve the community too. I love it. I love it. We're, we're doing something similar at yeah. Arena, a lot of online activity. And uh, it's been exciting to really focus on on uh, artists and audiences online and be able to keep connecting. You know, when I was at Perseverance, because I ran it for 19 years, we toured over 80 times around the state. So we went to Kotzebue, we went to Nome, we went to Queefluck, we went to um, all the uh, areas in uh, Southeast Alaska and we traveled by Beaver Plain and we traveled by helicopter and we traveled by boat and we went all over. Um, so I would just encourage you to open that up as you come back in, get around to the whole state 
because only 700,000 people and it's a fifth the size of the United States. Just go, Leslie. Awesome. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing that you're doing what you're doing with uh, online activity. Yeah. And uh, that's fantastic, but hopefully you'll have a chance to. Yeah, there is get, nothing get, like the person. The villages, we know, love it with the Winter Bear Project. That's, and we're looking to build on that. So we know there's in-person, but we can also get to some of the remote folks with, uh, you know, through the internet. Virtually. That's great. I love it. <clears throat> so we're really living in a heightened awareness around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And you have been such a deep thinker in this area and have been working to advance uh, the field for some time. Are you seeing differences in approaches in the last few months? Are you seeing any changes out there? What are you, what are you feeling in the field? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's, of course, it's <clears throat> multi-pronged, right? There's many layers. Um, we're seeing some major organizations, major, uh, what have been historically or predominantly white institutions, really decide, oh, we're leaders in the field. We've got to become anti-racist. And of course, that's a whole process to really dig in and shift, not just your thinking, but really your mind, body, and spirit, because it's so embedded how we're conditioned and what's normalized. So, um, and then we have the, um, what we call BIPOC now, Black, Indigenous, and other theaters of color, um, who I think are figuring out over time now, I've even been supportive, because part of my career, I've been able to navigate uh, working inside predominantly white institutions who are working on diversity um, and work with legacy theaters of color. I'm so fortunate. El Teatro Campesino, Penumbra, of course, East West Players, now our oldest or longest professional running theater and um, Native Voices. I've, I've been very fortunate to, to walk in all these worlds and they're finding their visibility and um, have always been in there as activists. Really, many of those theaters were started because of activism to be visible, to tell our own stories. But they're kind of getting finally their due, I think. Funders are even starting to understand over the last number of years, they've been underrepresented and under-resourced. So funding is starting to shift and get more equitable. There's there's some ways to go still, but that's exciting to see and important to see. Um, I've been in conversations and involved with the cohort still with TCG's program, the you know um, Institute for EDNI, and um, they are starting to absolutely. They've over time been pivoting to use that word pivot again to center BIPOC voices, but basically they're actually going to do that much more committedly, much have, you know more fully, and so funding for um, audience revolution. Um, or, you know, programs like that. We're starting to see it happen. There's a lot of talk with the VCU, uh, White American Theater as well, uh, about how to actually do that. Those demands are a great roadmap. They're a guidebook to how to become an anti-racist, racial, uh, racially equitable organization. Yeah, it's a very important document. Yeah. Really important document. <clears throat> well, I'm curious about a ridiculous thing, which is, People now are sometimes saying DEI instead of EDI. Why? I don't know. I don't know if it just rolls off your tongue a little easier, you know? But I, I think of it this way. You want to be equitable. So you, or I have a logic about it. Let me go this way. People think, oh, we need to get diverse. But what you think is diverse could really absolutely um, be influenced by your own bias, your implicit bias. Sure. Then I say, so then think about being inclusive then because then you're starting to open up that thinking and take you know take into account your bias and mitigate that but then you want to move toward actual equity so that's more of a d-i-e but that spells die so we don't want that <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it leslie you're a director and what yeah. are you really looking forward to direct and why it's a good question um, I'll just give you a little hint. We haven't quite announced this yet because we've been thinking deeply. I'm a deep thinker, as you know, um, about what we can offer the community. We do know we're, we're going to offer in staves based on the original um, source material of a, of a Christmas carol, a clinket Christmas carol that Vera Starbard has very cleverly adapted. And we'll drop that in actual uh, chapters right after Thanksgiving, every Friday up through Christmas. 
I'm watching the pre-recordings of this. It's fantastic. And there's probably going to be maybe some music that comes out of it that you can, you know, enjoy with that series and beyond. And then also there's another piece. Um, I won't say what it is yet because I promised my team, <laughs> but I get the opportunity to direct my husband, Wesley Mann, who's a terrific character actor. In fact, he worked at Arena Stage right before you came. Yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, fantastic. I'm fantastic. really excited about that. We haven't gotten to have that kind of collaboration in a while. And um, I'll just share this. I'm maybe talking out of school a little bit. There was a time very early in our relationship where we weren't getting along. And we've been together for a number of years, a decades. And um, we lived together a long time before we married. But, um, and, but the one place we got along was on the stage. We just got into that collaborative space and it was like, it helped heal us. It was beautiful. So, and gratefully we've been married a long time now and I'm just excited to be able to get to work with him. Yeah. Well, Leslie, it's so great to be able to talk to you tonight. And uh, I'm so proud of all the work that you're doing at Perseverance Theater. You, uh, you're doing terrific work. So congratulations. Thank you, Molly. It means the world coming from you. And I look forward to our conversations offline too, to keep you Absolutely. Posted. Absolutely. You take care. Bye-bye. Alejo is an award-winning costume designer. He's worked in theaters all over the country and internationally, including at places like Arena Stage. He also designs for opera, the, ra uh, uh, the uh, Radio City Rockettes, and has even worked in the circus with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. And we're going to get him in just a moment, but I just, I just got a note saying we have lost Alejo in the attendees, so I'm sure that he is crazed trying to get back to us. It was really a pleasure working with Alejo on Anything Goes. One of the things that I was really interested in the production was uh, to really be able to find the kind of style and uh, glamour uh, that uh, would be in Anything Goes. And I thought he would really um, be one of the ideal designers for that. And he really was. And I just say, see, Alejo just said, I'm in. He's just saying to all of our panelists, I don't understand what's going on. There he is. <laughs> it was not my fault. <laughs> Was was this a magic trick, like in the like in the circus? No, 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 no. I don't know. I was watching you. I was like mesmerized by, by everything that uh, Leslie was saying. I can tell you about like the decades he spent together with her husband, and the Christmas Carol project and everything. So I don't know what happened. Well, we're uh, we're glad you're here. <laughs> hi, Molly. Hi, Alejo. I was just going to keep riffing about you and your and your work. Um, you're. You love actors. Oh, I love now that. Them. Yeah, that may seem odd for audiences that are watching, but sometimes there are designers that just design the clothes. And then there are other designers who design through the inspiration of the particular actors. And that's what I watch you do, because when we were casting for Anything Goes and Newsies, you immediately wanted to know who the actors were, what they looked like, what they felt like for you to be able to really complete the designs. Will you talk about that? Well, I think like it's very important to bring the actor into the equation. I think it's pivotal. I mean, like what we do as costume designers, you know, in, in what we do, character comes first, right? It's storytelling. So when you design a show, you design for no particular actor in mind unless the show has been already cast. And I really appreciate the the input that the actor brings, not only uh, with the way they look, the way you know they stand, the way they um, they act or sing, but also like what is their take on the character? Because at the end of the day, I mean, you I cannot force a design onto a person. I need to adapt it, um, and I really always get great feedback from the actors collaborating and working together. I think the most successful work whether it's something beautiful or something, you know, distress or whatever it is, is when like you work with the actor. I mean, 
collaborating in the fitting room. That's why to me, the fitting is like sacred, it's very essential. It's a, it's a place that um, I really need to get this character like finalize and help the actor. I mean, like there's no better compliment as a designer as when you're in a fitting and you put um, something on an actor, whether it's a pair of boots, a hat, a shirt, a vest, and they really feel like they finally found that character that they were working on. It's really, really gratifying. And I've seen you do that time and again. And I see the kind of uh, detail that goes into the fitting, the exactness of it, the way in which you, you work with all the artisans around, uh, around a dress and the little nips and tucks and changes. I'm really curious about um, how you make choices on shoes. Because I always feel like when actors are grounded with shoes, they can do just about anything. So how do you do that? That's such a good question because shoes, you know, like shoe wear is so important, you know what I mean? Because as you say, they need to feel grounded. And um, Again, you know, it's like a collaboration you have with the actor, probably the, the one that is the most interactive at all. And even the actors that do not like to express their opinions match, or they're very, they, you know, respectful or whatever, they always are very specific about um, shoes. And I remember like 20 years ago, around 20 years ago, well, yeah, 2001 actually was, I was an associate designer of this production of Seagull that Mike Nichols directed in the park with Mel Streep and all these actors. And when we had to do a fitting with Christopher Walken, who was in the show, he said to me, he told me, he's like, you can put me whatever you want, whatever, but I must wear used shoes. I've been a dancer all my life and I'm not going to break new shoes. So it's very interesting how like, it's so important for the actors to, to, to have, um, you know, that they feel comfortable uh, in their shoes, especially if it's a musical, but in this case it was a play. And it was the same case with Mel Streep. When she asked us, what are you gonna do for our shoes? We told her like, oh, we're gonna have them custom made in England. And she said, Natalie Porma was also in the show. She said, no, 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 please have costume shoes for Natalie. Just pull some old shoe for me. And we did, we pulled some shoes from stock and that's what she wore on stage. Wasn't there a story that you told me about something that happened with a, was it a hat pin? Uh, yes, it was a hat pin. Tell the yeah, story. We'll, we'll make it, we'll make it short. But she had, was playing Arcad Arcadina in, in, in Chekhov, um, Seagull. And in act three, you know, she's leaving the state, going back to Moscow. And she is very aggravated because she discovered that uh, Trigorin is having an affair or is infatuated with Nina. Uh, so she, while she's doing all the all, all the scenes, she's kind of dressing up to go back, and she puts on this coat, and then she puts on a hat, and it was a, a stunning hat, and she wanted a hat pin, and and the 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 the, the weave of the the straw was so incredibly tight that she was fighting every night, every night to put on that pin, and sometimes will bend. It was like it's just I will sweat in my seat. And, and so after three three times, I went backstage after the show was over and knock on her door. And I say like, Marilyn, I'm so, so sorry. I promise you will never happen again. I promise you by tomorrow, I'm gonna find you a hat as beautiful as this one, but that you will not have a problem. And I will never forget, she grabbed my arm and she told me, please do not take away that hat from me. That hat drives me absolutely bananas. And I have to be really upset with Kevin Klein who played Trigorin in the show in that scene. And I'm using that hat to trigger my anger. And that was such a great example of like a great actor using everything in order to, you know, like give the best performance. Another actor could have like, you know, pitch a fit in, an, in a different situation, but she kind of like, okay, I'm gonna use this to, in my advantage. I love it, I love it. You know, in the design process, I'm curious about what gives you the most joy. The brainstorming at the beginning, the building of the show, or seeing the costumes move across the stage, or the fitting. You know what, I will be, I will cheat, and I will tell you that the journey 
because I can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. I can't have the research without what I, without the text and what I feed from the director. And then once I design, I, you know, like I start collecting fabrics. So the journey is just so gratifying. And I think obviously if we talk about like self gratification, the best is like the first time you see them on stage and, and, and you realize that it works, that you turn something that it works. And not because it's beautiful uh, in the sense of like being ostentatious or being wonderful. Um, it could be, you know, a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, but it just needs to be the right one for that scene. And it's always very gratifying when you feel like you really contributed to the storytelling. Well, I think the best do. theater, the yeah. best theater that I've seen and I've worked on is when literally everybody is talking in the same language yep. that all those roads you know yep. like conveying like and yep. going in the same direction with that beautiful collaboration real collaboration so uh, as my last question for you what are you creating right now we're not in the theaters we're desperate to get back in the theaters what are you doing as an artist now that's filling you up well, I've been uh, doing a lot of um, other work. I've been like participating. I've been a member of the our union, United Scenic Artists H9, uh, a member of the diversity community. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of work for us to do and we're working very hard on that. I'm also part of a project that started in July called ETD, Equity Through Design, which is a mentoring project. Um, designers in all disciplines mentoring a uh, BIPOC, um, students from high schools and colleges. Um, it's a one-on-one -on -one thing, so it's really exciting. Participating, uh, I'm not a member, but I participate every Monday on Design Action, another, another group. Um, I've been doing a lot of cl classes and talks uh, online. I mean, some of them like even like on YouTube, you know, for the National Arts Club in New York or, or colleges and universities. Um, and actually, right now I'm writing. Uh, I've been asked to participate on the upcoming uh, Bloomsbury Encyclopedia of Costume Design for Film and Television. And it will be three volumes. And I'm writing about the golden age uh, of costume design in Argentina movie uh, movies. So uh, I'm very excited. I'm trying to keep, keep busy. Well, much love to you, Alejo. A year ago at this time, we were, we were probably right in the middle of Newsies. And uh, I've loved working with you and love the way in which you talk about um, our profession. So thank you so much. And I can't wait to see you soon. Love, love uh, back at you, uh, Molly. You, sing is, you know is mutual, the love, the respect and the admiration. Love to you. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. That was a great trio, right? My guest next week will be Colleen Sinette Jennings, who is an actor, a director, and a playwright, professor of theater emerita at American University. Christine Evans, who's a playwright and the associate professor of performing arts at Georgetown University, and Felicia Curry, who is an actor and a singer. And right now, an actor and a singer who will start uh, performing on the wharf in an arena stage production of Fannie Lou Hamer is Ife Butler. So uh, we're very excited to be uh, doing an outdoor performance for 10 performances uh, down at the wharf, socially distanced, of course, with audience in mass and everything else, um, because we're part of the pilot program from the city to see how we can do outdoor performances and to see what we do in terms of our safety reg regulations to make sure it's safe for the audience and for the actors. And Fannie Lou Hamer was a great unsung hero uh, from the civil rights period, and it was all about voting. So everybody knows, I'm sure everybody that's listening to this program has already gotten out to vote. Uh, I know I have, so get out the vote. Today's Gift of Art is a new song from next season's world premiere musical, American Prophet, Frederick Douglass in his own words. This was originally created to celebrate the wedding anniversary of Anna Murray Douglas and Frederick Douglass. On September 15, 1838, Frederick Douglass and Anna Murray Douglas were married. 
As an abolitionist, she was instrumental in securing Frederick's freedom from slavery. Let the Storm Come, featuring Crystalline Lloyd and Cornelius S. Smith Jr., co-written and directed by Charles Randolph Wright, co-written and music by Marcus Humann, coming to Arena Stage in a premiere this next year. All right, take care. me crying and you say what have I done 